Guys, I want to thank the sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, my friend Cody Nelson, the glassing guru, the optics authority. He's the optics manager at GoHunt.com. If you have any interest in buying optics or have any glassing questions, whether it be tripods, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, range finders, anything to do with glassing, give Cody a call 702-847-8747. That's extension 2 or you can email him at optics at gohunt.com. You can also send him a text or call him on his cell phone at 602-399-3699. Guys, right now at GoHunt.com Insider, you can take advantage of the free trial. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J Scott. You're going to be able to take advantage of a free trial of the Insider. GoHunt is always adding more value for their Insider members. They've now added real 3D maps as a part of Insider for no additional cost. What an incredible value. Very soon, they're going to have their mobile app up as well. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J Scott and sign up for a free trial. If you're already an Insider member, it's automatically part of your Insider membership. And you can just go to the Maps tab up at the top once you sign in as an Insider. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. That's the gear that I wear on all of my hunts. To find out more, you can go to KUIU.com, Kuyu.com. They're a direct-to-consumer company. They sell everything off of the Kuyu.com website. I also do a lot of question and answer on my Instagram where I'm answering questions about guys wanting to know about gear about Kuyu, so tune into my Instagram. I want to thank Kuyu for their sponsorship. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. Again, thanks to all the sponsors of my podcast. Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I've got my friend Jeff Lester of Hunt Hard Outfitters out of Springerville in Eager, Arizona. Jeff, how you doing? Great, Jay. How are you? Good. Before we get going, we've got a New Mexico deadline here, and I know you've been talking to a bunch of guys in New Mexico. Uh, First off, how is the moisture looking? Um, And with that being said, how does the moisture compare to maybe, say, a month or a month and a half ago? Where are we at now with our current status? Well, before Christmas, Jay, um, it was rough. I mean, it 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 was really rough. I mean, we were dry across the Gila. Uh, We had a terrible monsoon last year. You know, we had a great spring last year. Terrible monsoon. Um, Elk were really brittle all through the season. Saw a ton of broken bulls later on in both states, Arizona and New Mexico. And uh, in in the end, you know, we were really stressed, but we really started to pour on some moisture here after Christmas. Um, So right now where we're sitting, I mean, we've seen consistent storms for the last three weeks to a month and a half. I mean, it's, we, You know, it just depends where you are. New Mexico has picked up more storms than this side of eastern Arizona. Uh, So, I mean, where we're sitting right now, I mean, it's snowing at my house right now. So it's, it's, we've, we've been getting some decent moisture. I don't think it's, I mean, we kind of got saved here. As long as we get another few storms, I think we're going to be okay. I'm not saying it's going to be game average busters. okay or or going to keep us no, from being yeah, below I think average in New Mexico. No, I think we're going to be we're we're sitting, you know, average. I mean, not above average by any means, but I think we're we're going to be all right. I mean, New Mexico, you got to remember I live right here on the east side of the state in Arizona, but New Mexico from here to Socorro, they've gotten a few more storms than we've got here. So I think New Mexico is going to be pretty good. I mean, like I said, it's not gangbusters, but it's nothing like last year. But if we get some spring moisture out of this, uh, hopefully we do get some spring. Last year we had a phenomenal spring, which isn't normal because we usually don't have hardly anything in April and May. And last year we really got hammered in those months. So it just depends. I mean, sometimes it's really hard playing the moisture game and really what we're getting. Uh, 
I, I mean, I've seen I've seen it worse. I mean, where we just go all winter with hardly anything, you know. Do you where think, we were in that really up and down drought ten years ago, you know. So, do you think if we continue to get some storms over the next, let's say, you know, two months, and just get a few timely storms, do you think? Even with last year's monsoon being horrific, and let's say we have a average to good monsoon this year, do you think the brittleness and the density of bone antler, uh, or you know, of of, of antler um, and body condition going into the winter, do you think it could all be turned around and have a pretty darn good year, or do you think the writing's on the wall from how bad they were they went into this winter? Is that going to affect antler growth um, moving forward, no matter what happens? You know, that's the big debate. <laughs> I've, I've talked to numerous, you know, booking agents and clients and people who have asked the same question you're asking. And at the end of the day, sometimes I wonder if I have any idea how this really works because I've seen dry years where the bulls looked great. And I've seen the opposite. So this year, seeing all the broken bulls, I mean, it was obvious. It was a brittle antler season. I mean, stuff was crushed up. And then, you know, you'd see a bull that was intact and all put together. And you're like, why is that bull doesn't have nothing broke on it? And he's spindly or something. And then you got another bull sitting right next to him. It's just shattered to pieces. You know, it. you just don't, sometimes I just, we don't know how it all fits in the, the big scheme of things. I mean, I think my personal opinion, I think we're going to be okay. I mean, the mountain bulls are definitely now when I say mountain bulls, I mean, you look, you take one twenty seven, and then you take the Gila just across the state line here. And that country, the big timber, you know, the mountain meadow and grandma and the grass that comes in in those units is different sometimes than your, northern stuff in arizona and your northern st your your stuff that pushes out into more the arid desert and high desert in new mexico such as 13 some of those units 17 so the mountain bulls can they, they find the feed they get the water it's a little different they got those big north hillsides they got browse uh you, you go out in some of these more arid units and it's a different story um so i think it's it, it's kind of unit like you can separate it by unit. Um, I mean, we see that from year to year, even on a, on a year where you have spotty moisture, where it just depends on the moisture that they get, you know, versus, you know, you can have a place 12, 15 miles away. That's completely different. So I don't know, man. I wish, I wish you had that answer for me Jay, <laughs> because honestly, it's, it's a hard you know, it's hard to see and, and, and to, to figure out what it's going to do. You know, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I saw like last year I mean, we had a great season last year. I mean, we really did have a pretty good season. Uh, we ended up, you know, just right where we normally are. And we, we had a lot of real, we were hunting lots of really solid elk. Um, so you know, until the late seasons when we were seeing a lot of broken bulls, but we were still finding bulls that were intact. You just had to sift through them, you know? So, uh, Jeff, it's, it's, so what you're saying is it's a toss-up. I mean, it really nobody knows until the, the season gets here and we're looking at the antlers and, you know, through the rut and seeing if they're holding together, seeing if the yeah. antler growth is good. Um, you think... It, you don't think it's going to be an absolute banner year, but you think it could easily be average or even just slightly. Yeah, above I think average. it could be. I think it could be average. Okay. I, I, I mean, I'm thinking it's going to. You know, a lot of people have said that. Uh, I've heard people say, "Well, our bulls looked poor going into winter." And if I was to sit there and, I mean, I didn't, I didn't necessarily see a lot of that. Like, I, I didn't think the elk looked terrible. I mean, other than you know, the antlers being broken up and stuff. I mean, the elk look pretty healthy to me in a lot of them, in a lot of places we were hunting. Um, I'm not saying now, you know, the, the water condition was pretty rough. I mean, I was seeing a lot of elk move because they, they didn't have water where they were because I mean, I seen dirt tanks dry at the end of season that I've never seen <laughs> dry. I mean, there was, 
there was multiple places in New Mexico as well as here in Arizona that just they had no water. I mean, there was just no water. The elk had to, you know, vacate and go other places to, to get to the water or windmills or places that had man-made water. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, this moisture has been pretty wet that we've gotten right here le- recently. So I think, you know, there's been some runoff. You know, it was kind of interesting when I was in Mexico hunting, uh, right when we got to the ranch that we were hunting, a lot of the dirt tanks had no water in them. And within just two days of being, we had massive, you know, rains. As you know, in Mexico, we got really hammered last month in a couple of spots on a, you know, a couple of long storms. And those dirt tanks filled right up, uh, had good runoff. And that's all it takes is just getting some good, solid storms. And now those, those tanks will pick up the water The you know, it, it, you know, it happens. So, like I said, I'm not a, I'm no, I'm no biologist by any means. I kill elk for a living. So, um, I mean, I try to stay on top of it and understand it, but you know, it doesn't take much for to change my mind or see something that really, I you know, yeah. we've talked about that monsoonal moisture, you know, like, and I just swear when we do, don't get the rains late and those bulls finish out growing season without good green feed on the ground, they're brittle happens i mean you can almost you can almost check mark that one yeah set your, that if we set don't, your clock by it yeah set your clock to it because if you don't get that late rain i mean that rain when those elk are finishing out good I don't july know what rains it, yeah yeah good, july. good july rains is so important for the elks the density of the mass in the antler yeah and, and i mean the density in the antler for where they're strong and I've seen that numerous times. When you have a poor monsoon, you got broken bulls all season. So, Jeff, you have uh, the option for landowner permits and then draw tags. And there's in New Mexico, I'll have you explain it to some of the guys that are listening that may be new. New Mexico has a tiered st- uh, system where that you can just apply on your own for public, you know, public units, or you can apply in an outfitter pool, and the outfitter pool in most circumstances gives you actually a better opportunity to draw talk about um and and maybe come from a standpoint of people that have been listening for a long time and then also the new person and kind of walk through the different options that as an outfitter in new mexico you have okay so when somebody calls and they're 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 trying to figure out the whole system it's pretty simple to to understand so there's a, obviously there's a certain amount of draw tags that are issued in per unit uh, that people can apply for and draw. And in, that, in, in those tags, 10% of those tags go into what they call the outfitter pool. And then there's another 6% of those tags that go into the non-outfitter, just general pool that out-of-staters can draw. Now, a guy could draw one of those 6% tags and still hire an outfitter, but, but he could put in on his own. To be in the outfitter pool, you have to contract with an outfitter to apply into that pool. That pool gives you, you're, you're bidding for those 10% of tags. So if we have 100 tags, 16 of the tags are set aside to go to out-of-staters. 10% will go into the outfitter pool, 6% will be in the other pool. And then the other 84% are drawn from resident New Mexico hunters. Um now, landowner tags are on top of all of those public tags. So depending on the unit, there might be a lot more tags in one unit. It's, it's all you know, dictated off how much private land is in the unit. So let's just say a landowner has 1,000 acres. He might get a tag. He might get two tags. It, it's all on elk usage on their property and such and such. It goes on and on. So if a, if a landowner has a really big place, he say a landowner or big ranch is 50,000 acres. Okay, so he might get say 15 tags. That landowner can now designate his tags unit wide or ranch only. If they're ranch only, those tags have to stay on the ranch. Meaning that guy can lock his gates. When you book a, uh, buy one of those tags from an outfit or whatever, he probably has at least, you would hunt on that public land. I mean, on that private land. 
The only tags we as Hunt Hard Outfitters deal with is I only buy unit-wide landowner tags. A unit-wide tag is where you have small contributing ranches, or you might even have a big ranch that's in the program, meaning he, he designates his tags unit-wide. Those tags now can be validated and be hunted not only on that private, but they can be hunted on the national forest in the, in the entire unit on public lands. So, uh, and now anyone else could hunt that private as well, not just the guy that bought the tag. It, so it's like an open gate program um, or, you know, people can go in and hunt that public. I mean, that private land is put back into the mix um, in, in that particular unit. Now, some units have very little private land. So obviously, if there's very few tags in a unit, that's why the price is driven up on the landowner tag because it's a supply and demand. There's not very many tags. It's a premium unit. Obviously, the tag's going to be a lot more money. So that's how it kind of works. So when people come to me, you know, I'll apply someone for the draw. If they don't draw, they can find a tag. Sometimes I can find a tag. There's a lot of people bidding for the tags. There's brokers, there's outfitters, there's pe there's personal people that can, they, you know, might go out and buy a tag and hunt it on their own. So everybody's out there trying to buy these tags up and that's what's really driven the cost up over the last few years. So it's become, you know, have you seen, seen the competition for tags ever higher or is this the, the most demand that you've ever seen for elk tags in New Mexico? In the last five years, well, I mean, if you, if you want to, I mean, they've doubled, tripled, quadrupled in some areas in the last, you know, 10 years. It just keeps going up. We have seen it level out a little bit. Um, it definitely had a big spike probably from, I'd say, probably 2014, 16, right in there on. We've seen it spike, and it has kind of topped out. I mean, it, it, there finally becomes a time where it's like, you know, people have to look at the price they're spending on the hunt versus the animals they're killing, and there, it, that has helped it level out, I think. So what you're saying uh, is there's a ratio of price people will pay and size of what they're getting. Um, there, there is a point where those two curves, in essence, meet and kind of level each other out. Yes, for some. <laughs> and then there's people that just don't care and they just want to go elk hunting and money's not an object and they just spend money to, you know, because they know they're going on a, they have, might have an opportunity at a solid class bull, you know, 320 plus where, you know, that's, that's fine. If you, if you got deep pockets, <laughs> but talk, guys, you know, yeah, it's kind of, the talk money about, side of it's um, tough. Let's talk about that as far as, uh quality so you're hunting uh 15 16 17s T tell us the units that you hunt and let's talk about each unit um let's just go through them and talk about general quality of what people should expect well as a whole everything in new mexico that we're hunting we're hunting you know the stuff that's historically been the best you know elk hunting in new mexico now don't get me wrong you you dump over there towards you know, Rio Dosa and you get, you know, in the 34, 37, some of those other units. Don't get me wrong. They're killing some big bulls in those units. Um, we do stuff on a much smaller scale there. Uh, nothing like we do over on the west side of the state. Uh, but as a, as a whole, everything that we're hunting in New Mexico and, you know, Certain units in New Mexico produce, obviously, better elk typically than some of the other units. There's not a unit in New Mexico right here that we hunt that, you know, you can't pull a giant out of. I mean, it just happens. Every year there's some big bulls in some of these units, and, and it just happens that every year, you know, a couple of those big bulls will be killed. Uh, we mainly hunt, you know, 15, 13, 17, all the 16s, 23 um you know some years we'll have a few a hunter here and a hunter there and some years we'll, we'll we'll get a lot more hunters in those units you know some of these units such as 16 the 16s d or a are extremely tough to draw 
they're the best in the state and they're the most looked at and people hear, you know read about the gila and and but those tags to draw tags even in the outfitter pool or or through anyone else i mean you're down to you know you're in your two percent you know draw uh statistics it's it's a tough draw there's not getting there's no way of getting around that and there's very few landowner tags in those units because there's very little private land so the few tags that there are in those units are you know off the chart i mean you're you're upwards of 15 16 thousand for some of those tags and when you tack the hunt price on top of that it you know you can dump over 20 grand and it's you know how many guys can afford to say you know, if you're in a gun season you're on a five-day hunt so you're spending upwards of twenty thousand dollars to hunt a five-day hunt and a five-day hunt if you're trophy hunting you got five days it's it's a you know, like I said, there's guys that want to hunt and then there's guys that, that want to only hunt big giants and any outfitter that tells you that you're just going to come in here and you're going to be hunting 350 plus bulls is basically lying to you. Cause it's just not, I mean, New Mexico lives off its past reputation. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's still a great place to go and hunt quality bulls, but it's nothing like it was in the 90s late 90s or or you know early you know i mean you know i'm not trying to downplay the state by any means it still has phenomenal you're a uh, opportunity you're yeah a but you've got like you have to you have to be real right you have to be real and you know i try to bring people back to earth and so that they have a quality hunt because if they and, go in with the expectations that are too high, it sets it up for failure in the beginning, correct? Yeah, it does. And, you know, we're going to hunt the biggest bulls that are there. You know, if if we're on, you know, we're going to go, that's what we're targeting. We're targeting that upper age class of animal that we're going to try to find and hunt. But it's not like, you know, every bull that we see is up in that, in that category. It's just not. And, uh, I think people, you know, I mean, every day I get a phone call and the first thing out of someone's mouth is I want to hunt 350 plus bulls. And you know what? That's fantastic. I do too. I get it. I'm a hunter. I want to kill 350 plus bulls. The fact of the matter is, is you're, you, it's just not realistic. Even if you're in the very best units in New Mexico, um, you're only looking at a, you know, two or three percent of the bulls that are there to meet that three fifty plus category. Now, three hundred to three twenty, it's a bull factory. I mean, you're going to go see th that kind of bulls everywhere. It's the age class that has to get above that six, seven, eight year old elk to get start getting in his full potential of what that bull's going to be. Yeah, makes sense. Um... Let me ask and we you. kill them. We kill them every year. But don't call me and expect me to tell you that's what you're going to kill. I'm not saying we're not going to kill those bulls. We do every year, but not everybody kills those bulls. That's what you're saying. You're saying <laughs> yes. you get a huge volume of calls, and everybody wants the same thing. And when it's all said and done after the year, you've killed. A handful of great bulls but not everybody is going to get a great bull it, it has a lot to do with timing has a lot to do with how good the hunter is how good a shot he is how you know yep in in shape the hunter is um yeah but if you're looking for an elk hunt and you want to go hunt elk and you want to go hunt quality elk you are absolutely out of your mind if you're not putting in for new mexico because without the bonus point system, everybody's on an even playing field when it comes to odds. You're crazy not to throw your name in the hat because it is a great state to hunt in. Um, if, if quality is your only concern, you're just looking for, I mean, I have guys that call and say, I'm only going to kill a 370 bull. And I'm like, that right there just makes me want to pull my hair out because there's, there's other places you might want to look at. Right. If you're only interested in that, but not you're going to pay twice that, as much money or more. Yes. Yes. So everybody, I mean, it's like saying, 
you know, guys that go to Mexico for coups, they're like, I want a 120 buck. I'm like, me and you and everybody else. But the reality <laughs> is we only kill a couple a year if we're having a good year. And, yep. you know, you look at the number of 120-inch coups here that get shot in Mexico, and it's, you could probably count them on both your hands, like 10 bucks. Like, it's not... You know, it's just not a given that you go and shoot a 120-inch deer. Just like if you want to hunt quality elk and you go to New Mexico and you want a 370-plus bull, I mean, I get it all the time, and I'm like, I'm not even guiding in Arizona anymore, and but I'll try and help you. But it, the quality, you know, 350-plus, okay, we can talk about that's a little bit more manageable. But And, and they say, well, you don't think it's possible? Well, you don't think, no. I think it's possible, but it's not like it was 15 years ago. It's the the quality has come down, so you have to have realistic expectations. Oh, well, you don't think there'll be any 400 shot? No, there will be, but you've got you know a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, however many thousands of hunters out there, and one or two will get shot. Yes, and a handful will get shot over 370. And that's just the reality. You only see the top five or six bulls shot in each state in the magazines. That's it. You don't see all the other guys. And that's right. I and think if it you doesn't took, pay to paint a correct picture of what actually is out there. That's right. And if you took what you're what you're saying right now, take all the annuals, take all the the booking agents, take everybody that's out there sending hunters here and there, and all of that, and all the social media, you take what you consider as big trophy bulls or bucks or coos, mule deer, whatever you're looking at. And you take that and you look at the percentage of, of people in the field versus true world-class trophies. It's below 1%. I guarantee it. It's like a tiny sliver of what is out there. Yeah. And it's, that is, but we've become in this age that we are at, it's it. We've talked about this before, Jay. It's at your fingertips. People see it. They see the big animals. And then you've also got to look at this. And I'm going to say this, and I hope a lot of people understand that don't believe everything you see. Just because you see this big, massive, giant animal on social media, I could show you picture after picture <laughs> of social media of the real animal in the field and Are you talking you about wide-angle lenses? <laughs> yes. You would be shocked. People would be absolutely shocked if they saw the real-time photo of an animal that didn't get made to look large. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm – I mean, we, we prop our animals up and we make them look good in photos. We try to. At the same time, we – you know, not all guides take the, mo the best photos, so sometimes we don't get that. Yeah. Um, but there's people out there that take an unbelievable photo. And when you see the real animal in real life, real time, you would, people would be shocked <laughs> yeah. that it's with the photos you know, and with, you know, the stretchy tapes, it's, it's really gotten out of hand. And I think that's a good bit of advice on, on whatever you're hunting is, you know, understand that there's some shenanigans going on out there and any, you know, you can play with the photo angle and make it look like anything you want. And you can say it's, you know, anymore, you can just say it scores whatever it scores and no one's out there fact checking. Um, I, I just have a couple more minutes here. I do want to circle back to your bread and butter are 16s what what units are your bread and butter for people out there um and um what what's your favorite two units if you had to say these are the best two units for quality archery elk hunts which which two are they well we're always going to lean for the best of the best to try to draw somebody we're going to lean to a 16 d 16 a okay i mean those are those are phenomenal units if we can draw the tags Obviously, there's a pile of other people, pile of other outfitters. Everyone's trying to draw those same tags. Um, so when a guy calls me, I say, you know, what are you looking for? I don't want to go elk hunting unless I'm in this unit, or I don't want to go elk hunting unless this is what I'm after. Okay, then we might swing for the fence. And like I said, you're crazy not to be swinging for the fence. If you're a guy that says, I want to go on an elk hunt every year, or I want to come every other year, well, then we're going to play some different units. It doesn't mean we can't go to one of these other units and kill a really solid animal. Um, 
So we, we basically are trying to form fit what your expectations are to what there is to be offered. And depending on that is, you know, we, we build a file for every guy. We say, okay, what do you want? What, what kind of shape are you in? You know, yeah. um, I, I ask that to every client. One of the first things I ask a guy, what kind of shape are you in? You know, yeah, and also um, it's like, do you mind sleeping on the ground for your whole hunt and eating backpacking meal? Or do you want yep. to stay in a hotel? And that rules out half the people right there. And then you can. So what you're saying is you customize your hunts for what people want and what people can actually do. Yeah, I ask a lot of questions because I want to know how pissed off someone's going to be if they get here and they don't get what they thought they were getting. So beforehand I ask all those questions so that I know what you're getting, <laughs> right? what you're getting yourself into. Um, and that's really important, you know, because you, no matter what in a service related business, you're not going to please everybody. You're going to, someone's going to come, someone's going to be pissed off because they felt that it might not have been what they thought it was going to be. So we try to cover that long before you ever get to camp. And that to me is very important. That's why being truthful and honest to the client is so important. And sometimes, like I said, pulling the air out of their sails, you know, they don't like that. But at the same time, Hey, I'm the guy to bring you to earth to let, let's talk real here. Let's be real about this. You know how many times Jay, I've had someone tell me they were, you know, I, I say out of you know, one to 10, what kind of shape are you in? And I consider myself a seven and I do this for a living. Okay. I have people say, Oh, I'm a, I'm a six or I'm an eight. And then they get here and I'm like, what, you know, obviously they didn't understand what I was trying to say or right. explain <laughs> right. because your physical condition is 90% of the outcome of your hunt typically. Yeah. And, you and can't if a get guy around, you can't get to these bulls, you know, last year we had an archery hunter in camp that was on oxygen. Okay. And the guy was the, one of the best dudes I've had in camp. He was great guy. Awesome guy. We did what we could with him to kill him a bull. We did not kill him a bull. It was tough. We were very limited. We had to set him, you know, maybe a certain point where we could call for him or something like that, but it was extremely tough. Great guy, great sport, understood the hill we were climbing. But people need to know their limitations and what they can do. And as long as you understand that and you come for the experience and you've been, you know, and everything's set out in front of you, you're going to have a good hunt. But you have, to, you have to give the outfitter, the guides, you have to give them some, some leeway to, to know that, you know, I mean, I had a guy in his upper eighties call just recently and he had a lot of points in Arizona and he said, I'm, I'm looking for 380 plus. I didn't even know what to tell the guy. Like I was trying to be nice, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, we're not miracle workers here. Like, yeah, I mean, at some point in time, you just have to turn people away and say, I'm sorry, your expectations are way too high and you, you've you're setting us in a position of, of not being able to succeed and, and creating such a high bar that, it, you know, no matter what we do, we kill a nice 360 bull, you're not going to be happy. Right. So for everyone out there listening, make sure your expectations on whatever hunt you're going on are real. Um, Jeff, I've got to run. It's been great talking to you. I want to give you a chance to let people know how they can talk to you more, how they can find out more about these New Mexico hunts. Uh, where they can follow along. So would you give them that? And uh, guys, uh, give Jeff a call. He's been a long time uh, helper here on the podcast with information, and I recommend giving him a buzz. So the best way to find us is hunthard.com. Uh, you can go on there, go to the outfitter section. Uh, we're a little lazy on our outfit, I mean, on our, our web page to get stuff up. If you want to go to really recent stuff, you follow us on Instagram. That's hunt hard underscore gear. And then you can find us on Facebook uh, as well as at hunt hard. Um, and then you can call me at 928-245-2668. 
and calling my cell um, or texting my cell and saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you, and then I'll call you back. I, I like when people text because they put their name and number right there in the phone. I can get back to them in a timely manner, and uh, I, sometimes I'm not in a place where I can write it down or whatever, and that way I can get back to you. Um, and I, and I, if people want to talk, feel free to call, and we'll talk. I mean, if people want to know more about the system, that's why I'm here. I mean, this is what I do. You know, this year I haven't been on the road at shows due to the COVID BS. So, I mean, I've just been here, you know, talking with clients and people and, and answering people's questions. So feel free to call. And if you have any questions, you know, before the deadline, it's good to just find out, you know, and, and build a strategy. And, and like I said, you're crazy not to be in. New Mexico has piles of good opportunity at, at good hunting between sheep and antelope, elk, deer, everything. But you've got to be informed, know how it works, and know what you're doing. So, Jeff, it's always great having you on. I appreciate it. Um, congrats on a great buck in Mexico again. And um, it's always fun talking to you. I'm glad the moisture's coming. Let's keep it going. And I hope you get snowed in and can't leave your house uh, here when the next storm comes. And you can just call <laughs> and tell me you, you need uh, someone to come snowplow your driveway. Let's hope that happens. And uh, it's always great talking to you. So God bless, buddy. Okay? All right, man. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye.